Good morning, and thank you for joining me on the Path to Liberty. I'm Michael Bolden with the 10th Amendment Center, and this is the show for Monday, May 16th, 2022. And today, I've got the four primary ways, the four, I guess, approaches for people to read the Constitution, the way that most people do it. They choose one of these four, and surprise, 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 three of them are actually wrong. So on this episode, I'm going to give an overview of each. Strict construction, living constitutionalism, something called textualism, and originalism. So you can compare each of them, see how they are similar or different. And I know you'll be surprised the one that very few adhere to is really the only right one. But first of all, before getting to that, a quick hello to everyone out in the live chat and a big thank you. I really appreciate you spending some time with me today, whether this is your first episode or you've been here for every single one since day one. But while we allow people another moment or so to get those notifications to join us on these mainstream platforms for the live stream. Hi to everyone out there. Tim in Arizona. Cheriton Farmer in Missouri, DHD Van Horn, that Liberty Gal down in DFW, Tyler B, Dixie Strong in Bama, Liberty Revolutionary, good to see you, buddy. Lisa 67, Clay Kent, Murray Ray in Michigan, Johnny Johnson, Alan Mosley, good to see you, buddy. M. Gabriel, John Hume, and everyone else. I appreciate you spending some time with me, and thank you for being here, but let's get right to this. I want to start out with the first one. Again, we're talking about strict constructionism, living constitutionalism, textualism and originalism. A lot of times people get those confused. Some of them they think are actually the same thing when they're really the not, really not. So I want to explain these to you. Here we are with strict constructionism. Here from Wikipedia, they give an interesting overview, a nice basic one. Strict construction requires a judge to apply the text only as it is written. Once the court has a clear meaning of the text, no further investigation is required. Judges in this view should avoid drawing inferences from a statute or constitution and focuses only on the text itself. So it has nothing to do with the situation at hand, how it's applied or how they drafted it. And here from Larry Solemn, this is an old school blog over a decade, but it has some interesting uh, overview of this. He said the phrase appears to have become popular as a campaign slogan used by Richard Nixon when he ran for president in 68. Nixon, he writes, promised that he would appoint judges who were strict constructionists as opposed to the judicial activism that characterized the Warren court. But the phrase has much earlier origins and may go back as far as the late 18th century. And you can even go further than that uh, to St. George Tucker in the view of the Constitution of the United States back in 1803, the first detailed overview of the legal meaning, original legal meaning of the Constitution here. Tucker wasn't actually saying we have to be strict constructionists in this manner, but he was saying there are certain situations where you have to be, you have to strictly construe. Here, for example, deviations, Tucker said, from the fundamental maxim of the government are to be construed strictly. So if you have fundamental maxims of how the document was structured, any deviation must be construed strictly and not made use of as precedents to justify others, where the Constitution by its silence must be presumed to have referred it to that head under which it properly fails. So that's St. George Tucker back in 1803. And here from Rob Nadelson, he explains a little bit further. He said, strict construction is this. If a word, this is the simple version, if a word or phrase has two possible meanings, then apply the narrow, narrow one. And here's an example, and this, I'm not sure if this is the best analogy, but I think it's an interesting approach. He said, suppose you're reading a document and you see the word vegetable. And of course, we're talking about legal documents here. Assume the document doesn't make it clear whether the wor word refers only to vegetables that we eat, things like broccoli and cabbage, our day-to-day breakfast. Uh, um, breakfast, vegetables, maybe that should be my breakfast from now on, or to all plants, as an animal, vegetable, mineral. Strict construction would dictate the narrow meaning, vegetables like broccoli and cabbage, rather than the broader one. So that's just an approach where you have two versions, you're always going to go with the more narrow meaning. Now, Christopher Cook over at Federalist Society, he has a really interesting uh, post on this, and he said, in his seminal book on interpreting legal texts, a matter of interpretation, Justice Scalia said in no uncertain terms, you may be surprised to hear this, I am not a strict constructionist, and no one ought to be. No one ought to be a strict constructionist, according to Scalia. He wrote, 
Indeed, a text should not be construed strictly, and it should not be construed leniently. It should be construed reasonably to contain all that it fairly means. So that's strict construction. Scalia was opposed to that. He was not a strict constructionist. And maybe it's just based on how people define it. Larry Solomon's blog talked about how, well, do we really have a definition? But this is the general understanding between that and how Nadelson put it. Next up, we have living constitutionalism. And I know everyone watching or listening to this probably knows this is definitely not the one we're supposed to follow. But here's a good overview. The living constitution or judicial pragmatism is the claim that the United States Constitution holds, holds a dynamic meaning that evolves and adapts to new circumstances, even if the document is not formally amended. So you can have one word that means one thing one day, and if society looks at that word differently, then the legal meaning of the text just changes with how the opinions of society change. <laughs> You guys probably know my thoughts on this. Here from Stephen Calabrese over at the Constitution Center. He said, living constitutionalists believe that the meaning of the constitutional text changes over time as social attitudes change. Even without the adoption of a formal constitutional amendment pursuant to Article 5 of the Constitution. And he gives an interesting example. He said, living constitutionalists believe that racial segregation was constitutional, was legal between 1877 and 1954. It was constitutional. Now, constitutional doesn't necessarily mean good or bad, and unconstitutional doesn't necessarily be, mean bad, but living constitutionalists believe that basically the Constitution means what the Supreme Court tells us it means until it changes its mind. Or if it says nothing on it, then it makes the first statement on it. So they take the position, according to Calabresi, I'm going to say it like that. It's probably Calabresi. But that racial segregation was constitutional until 1954 because public opinion favored it. And then it became unconstitutional only as a result of the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education in 54, 1954, a case in which they think the Supreme Court changed and improved the Constitution. So it's... Pretty wild. There's really just one definition Rob Nadelson said. There is no one single definition of living constitutionalism either, and he put it this way. There's no simple definition of this because, and he has disdain for living constitutionalists as an originalist, he says, because living constitutionalists differ greatly among themselves. They're united by dislike of many of the Constitution's rules and standards, and they all want to adjust the Constitution to serve their political goals. But beyond that, their unity ends. They sometimes have different goals and they propose different ways of justifying constitutional manipulation. But what we really should understand, though, is that a living, breathing constitution is really a dead one. It has no impact in law because it can change on a whim of society or how politicians are reading that. People with power are the ones that are going to use that to their advantage. A living, breathing constitution is a dead one. This is what the founders called arbitrary government. Government that could, well, do what it wants and then over time do what it wants again and then it's totally different. Arbitrary government to the founding generation was a tyranny and that's what they lived under under the British system. Was a system where government had final say, authority, final authority sovereignty where they could actually make the rules. It doesn't matter what rules you gave them. It was up to the government to decide. And that's how Nadelson puts it here as well. He said, living constitutionalism is a misnomer because when we abandon a document's rules and standards, the document dies. In practice, living constitutionalism converts our constitution into a parchment loincloth to cover political pedenda. That's a, a fun one. But here's how Samuel Adams put it. Samuel Adams uh, and James Otis Jr. and others in the Massachusetts Circular Letter, February 11th, 1768, in all free states, the Constitution is fixed. So the old revolutionaries recognized they weren't saying that you couldn't change a Constitution because the power flows from the people. And if the people want to change the Constitution, they make those changes through the approach that's provided for. But the legal meaning of the text stays fixed or there's no way that you live in a free state. Now, I'm going to link to all this stuff in the show notes. I should mention that if you want to follow us, follow this show and find all the references that I'm talking about in this episode and every episode, you'll find all our archives as well. You need to go over to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash 
path to liberty. I'll publish a blog post for this live stream about one to two hours after I'm done with this. And that way you can find all the different platforms we're on. We're on a bunch of live streaming video platforms. We archive all over the place as well. Brighteon and BitChute and Gab and Mines and everywhere possible. Rumble, etc. We have Odyssey.com. We also have the audio-only podcast edition on all the major platforms and some of the minor ones. If you want to see us on another one, please let me know. And I like mentioning this. I think it's important because... In this time, you never know. All of a sudden, one day I say the wrong thing, and I probably say the wrong thing all the time, just haven't been busted with it yet. And suddenly we're off one of your favorite platforms. We're off of all the mainstream ones. So you need to go to 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty if you find us missing at some point. You'll also be able to find our membership program where you can support us for as little as two bucks a month. Anyways, so we have the first two. That is strict constructionism and then living constitutionalism. The next is textualism, and I think a lot of people actually confuse textualism with originalism because Scalia we think of as the great originalist, but Scalia actually considered himself a textualist. Here's what textualism is. It's a formalist theory in which the interpretation of the law is primarily based on the ordinary meaning of the legal text. When where no consideration is given, no consideration is given to non-textual sources, such as intention of the law when passed, the problem it was intended to remedy, or significant questions regarding the justice or rectitude of the law, or original understanding, what people may have thought it meant. You just read the text in isolation and you find what it means in isolation. Now, sometimes you can go to definitions and old dictionaries and things like that, but there is no implication. And I think a lot of people understandably like this approach. Here's Nadelson again. Let me just pull this up if I can. He said, textualism is not the same thing as originalism. It's a method of interpretation that focuses on the meaning of words while generally avoiding materials generated during the legislative process or under the Constitution that would say the ratification process, the ratification debates. We wouldn't be looking at how uh, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists were defining various terms. We would just look at the terms themselves, find the definition of those terms, and then go with it. And then if you're a strict constructionist textualist, if there's two meanings, you take the narrower one. He said, it is usually applied to the interpretation of statutes. That's the primary way that they do this, that they use textualism. And he said, pure textualism is more defensible in modern statutory construction than in constitutional interpretation because legislative history is sometimes manipulated, manipulated in ways that the Constitution's background was not. Now, Scalia gave a bunch of reasons why you have to do this for federal statutes. Rob and others generally agree with him on that approach for interpreting federal laws that are passed, but he also advocated this very approach for reading the Constitution itself. And he never, ever explained why that I'm aware of. I don't think I've seen anyone point out how uh, Scalia ever went into any detail as to why you would apply this to both statute and to the text and original meaning of the Constitution. Anyways, our last one, which is the one that I say is the only one to follow, and that is originalism. And Rob puts it this way, Nadelson that is, he said, constitutional scholars have different ways of defining originalism, but I think they all boil down to this. Originalism is reading the Constitution the same way most judges would have applied it immediately after ratification, including, of course, the Bill of Rights, say around 1791 or 1792. So how did the judges at that time? And if you're thinking of Supreme Court justices, you're thinking of people like John Jay, James Iredell, James Wilson, people like that that were very influential in the founding and drafting, they were influential framers. They were influential, of course, in uh, the ratification debates as, li as well. So around 1791, 1792. And at that time, the courts construed most legal documents. And of course, we know that the Constitution for the United States isn't just a declaration. It is an 18th century legal document, so you have to read it like that. They used to apply it back then by seeking the intent of the makers. The intent of the makers is how they originally read the document. Now, a lot of people up until more recently, and now there's two different versions of originalism, there's original intent, 
taking from this phrase, a lot of people misconstrued this to think that you had to have the intention or the goal of the people who framed the text at the Philadelphia Convention, even though those proceedings were kept secret for so long. And does someone's goal, let's say like you have an Alexander Hamilton who's saying one thing during ratification about the limited nature of delegated and reserved powers, and then all of a sudden, soon as he has a chance to use that power in 1791, 1792, he flips a switch and says there's all kinds of implied power. So do we use Alexander Hamilton's personal intention on what he wanted to accomplish? Or does the intent of the makers, who are the makers? Are the framers, the people who drafted the Constitution, are they the makers? Or is it something else? And of course, it is something else. The makers, they, well, anyways, they were going to seek the intent of the makers. They used outside evidence, if necessary, to ascertain that intent. What is that intent? But who are the makers? In the case of the Constitution, Rob writes, the intent of the makers was the understanding of the delegates to the 13 state conventions that ratified the document. That's original understanding versus original intent. So who made the Constitution? Who were the actual makers of the Constitution? The people who gave it legal force were not the people who drafted it in Philadelphia, although some of them uh, played a part in that. They just made a presentation, a proposal. The people who made it the Constitution for the United States were the people who ratified it. So you have to understand the understanding of the people who gave the document its legal force. Now, James Madison, the so-called father of the Constitution, if we want to call him that, he specifically agreed with this approach. This was James Madison's approach. And here in a letter to uh, Light Horse Harry Lee or Henry Lee in June of 1824, of course, I will link to these original documents in the show notes, 10thamendmentcenter.com slash path to liberty. And here's how he put it. With a view to this last object, I entirely concur in the propriety of resorting to the sense in which the Constitution was accepted and ratified by the nation. You have to understand how the people who ratified it understood the document. And Madison put it this way, in that sense alone, it is the legitimate Constitution. There is no other way, according to James Madison, to look at the Constitution. Using Textualism might get us the same result. Strict constructionism might get us the same result. Living constitutionalism will almost never get us the same result because we never know what the goals of the uh, judicial activists are. But there are many different ways to get to the same result, but they don't always go that same direction. And Madison said to get the proper sense was to understand how the ratifiers understood the document. That is the only way to have the legitimate constitution. And he said, if that be not the guide in expounding it, there can be no security for a consistent and stable, more than for a faithful exercise of its powers. So if you always understand a legal document in the way that the, it was understood the moment it was given legal force, and you start from there, and if you want to make changes, you amend it, there's a process for that then you have a fixed constitution like Samuel Adams was talking about in 1768 in all free states. The constitution is fixed. Madison goes further. He said, if the meaning of the text be sought in the changeable meaning of the words composing it, and again, Madison is actually attacking the idea of a living, breathing constitution which I think probably got its popularity from the Woodrow Wilson days. I don't know the history of that super well, but that's where I've uh, found it and talked about it in uh, another episode. It's possible that it started much earlier as well, but I think that's really where it got its popularity. And Madison's attacking that right off the bat, because if you just have certain words and society changes the understanding of those words over time, then well, you're going to have a mess. And one example I like to give off often is the phrase post roads. We think of today, most of the time, when you think of the power over post roads that Congress has been delegated in the Constitution, we think that's every road in the country, in every state that the post travels over. It's somehow related to the post office because it's part of the same clause, the post office, post offices, and post roads. But a post office is something that handles mail. A post road is kind of like the interstate highway system. They were long roads, major thoroughfares that really connected cities that were marked by posts, like mile markers. So anything other than that, anything under other than a post road under the Constitution, 
those local roads, even lo local major highways, those were not under the authority of Congress under the power over post roads. So this is something that where you're looking at the changing definition of terms. And soon as you change that definition, it's possible that instead of just having power over a limited number of roads throughout the country, now they have power over 100 percent of them. And there are many ways we've seen those words change over time. General welfare, commerce, for example. All they have to do is convince enough people to vote for them and then support their expanded version of power. And that becomes kind of the de facto version under living constitutionalism. Anyways, I'm rambling on that. Here's Madison again. If the meaning of the text be sought in the changeable meaning of the words composing it, it is evident that the shape and attributes of the government must partake of the changes to which the words and phrases of all living languages are constantly subject. What a metamorphosis would be produced in the code of law if all its ancient phraseology were to be taken in its modern sense. So that's... That's James Madison attacking living, breathing constitutionalism, and that's James Madison at the same time supporting originalism. Understanding the legal meaning of the document is understanding the understanding of the ratifiers. Thomas Jefferson had the exact same view. What a surprise. A year earlier to William Johnson in a letter in 1823, and William Johnson was nominated by Thomas Jefferson to be on the Supreme Court back in like 1804, 1805, somewhere like that. He was just in his early 30s, and he was still on the Supreme Court when Jefferson was writing him here. And he said, on every question of construction, how to construe the document, on every question, Jefferson said, carry ourselves back to the time when the Constitution was adopted, recollect the spirit manifested in the debates, and instead of trying what meaning may be squeezed out of the text or invented against it, conform to the probable one in which it was passed. So understand the way that the people understood it and then approve the document. Don't just look at the words themselves and try to squeeze what meaning might fit your own personal view, whether it's broad or narrow. You have to understand what the ratifiers understood. And Nadelson sums it up like this. He said, Original, originalism means reading the Constitution as a court would have read it immediately after its adoption. This requires construing the document as it was understood by the ratifiers. That's the original understanding. Or if the original understanding can't be recovered, how an objective informed person would have read it under the original meaning. And this requires examining not merely the Constitution's text, but also previous history and contemporaneous law and commentary. So documents in support and opposed to the Constitution because you have to have a holistic understanding. This is why we read the Anti-Federalist Papers. This is why we study them. You can't just read the Federalist. In fact, and I know I say this a lot, but the Federalist really only helped impact ratification in New York State. It really wasn't read widely outside of New York. James Wilson's State House Yard speech was far more influential on the Federalist position. And let's say we're taking the Federalist view as definitive of what the Constitution means. If you're not reading the anti-Federalist papers that so many of them are specifically responding to, you can't under this understand the context of what they have to say. So this is all the kind of stuff that you have to read and understand to have the original public meaning. And we want to teach as many people as possible to be able to read the Constitution on themselves so they don't have to rely on politicians and lawyers and people like me to say, hey, this is what the founders meant by this phrase, provide for general welfare or necessary and proper or to regulate commerce among the several states. We want people to be able to read and understand that on their own. So we try to reach and teach more and more people about this original legal meaning of the Constitution, and nothing helps us get that job, job done more than the financial faith and support of our members. You can join us for as little as two bucks a month over at 10thamendmentcenter.com slash members. And I do want to say a quick hello or a quick thank you to a number of people who just joined us recently. Uh, I really, really appreciate your support. This is just a handful of uh, many people who have helped us out recently. There's Robert in Florida, Chris in Washington State, Ashley in Florida, Daniel in Nevada, Samuel in Illinois, Courtney in Florida. Florida is really representing lately. Thank you. Ken in Missouri, Jason in Iowa, Gary in Pennsylvania, and Lori in Oregon. I really appreciate all your support, whether it's just a couple bucks a month or it's a couple hundred 
Every dollar really goes a long, long way here at the TAC. Let me take a look over in the live chat and see if there's any questions that I can get back to uh, and see if there's any comments I can reply to. Hunter SF770 over on Twitch says, how did we get so far from say what you do and do what you say? I don't know. I think the attachment or the fear, John Adams said, fear is the foundation of government. Fear is the foundation of most government. I would say fear is the foundation of all government power. And a lot of people are just afraid all the time. So they're just willing to just let their team do whatever they want because they're afraid of the other team. And that's how they keep us, I guess, supporting in many ways, supporting a larger and larger monster state. Clay Kent says, as a libertarian, I think that the Constitution states what it means and should stand as the law of the land. If the people want to add to it or change it, the amendment process should be followed. But nowadays, it's just a piece of paper. Absolutely. And Madison himself specifically referred in Federalist Number 48 to the Constitution as a parchment barrier. You can't rely on words on paper to enforce themselves. When you get down to it, it is up to the people to keep the keep the government in check, in line with the Constitution. That is the only thing that makes for a free people. Thomas Jefferson, of course, we know, said a free people claim their rights as derived from the laws of nature and not as a gift of their chief magistrate. James Iredell, one of those first associate justices of the, of the Supreme Court at that time in 1791-92, he was said, if the government usurps power, if the federal government takes power that is not delegated to it, the people have to resist. The people will resist. That's how you keep the government in check. So in many ways, H.L. Mencken was probably right when he said democracy is a theory that people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard, something like that. Some Mencken fan probably knows uh, much better than I. Walt Boyer over on Facebook, late as usual. Good morning, MB from Newberry, Florida. I'm glad we had some problems with the stream on a couple of platforms last week. Restream was not being awesome with us, but uh, I'm glad to see that it's out there. Alan Mosley TV says, leave it up to a libertarian to get caught up on roads. Oh, talking about the post roads discussion. That's pretty funny. Tahira Redeemed said, the people are supposed to be the power that gives the Constitution its legal power. Yes, the source of all power, the the uh, origination of all power. George Mason told us this. Mercy Otis Warren, so many others said is the people. The people are the original source of all power. And when the people have given that up, they've basically allowed the government to be the final say over itself. Then you run into a problem where the government is going to just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And we see now we live under the largest government in history. But then we also have another problem. Most of the people today, unfortunately, we are literally surrounded left, right and center by people who love the monster state as long as it supports their own personal issues. Lisa says, remain teachable. Thank you. Really appreciate that. M Mr. Cartoon Critic says, nowadays, the will of the people. Yeah, this is kind of what I was getting at. The will of the people refers to the people who surrender power to the government or beg for more. And that's really the difficult thing that we face. I think it is far more important than, you know, every time we, we uh, send out an email or a, a newsletter or we post articles, we generally get some people say, you should show this to the members of Congress. Can't you mail this article to everyone in Congress? Facts or whatever it may be. Email them. It doesn't matter. It's less important that we convince people in Congress the problem that we face to somehow start following the Constitution than it is to convince everyone around us to be better on the Constitution and liberty, because then when the people take a stand, it doesn't matter what government tries to do. And that's really the founders approach, the old revolutionaries. And then we could even talk about people like Lysander Spooner as well. Jay Armstrong is correct. Judicial activism. So the living, breathing Constitution approach and legislating from the bench is not following intent. And that really is legislating from the bench, because if they're saying the meaning was this up until 1954, now we're going to make a new law by just having this opinion. And we're forgetting that Supreme Court opinions, even at the top of every Supreme Court opinion, says an opinion of the Supreme Court. It's up to us to start treating it that way. We have to treat the views on the Constitution, whether it's from the executive or the legislative or the judicial branch or from the states, as opinions. Now, if they happen to be right, that's a good thing. It's just not very often. And I think that's a really important point because this is not, as Jay writes, not following intent, meaning, and understanding. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I hope it was interesting. I hope you learned something. I didn't get into too much detail on it, but I wanted to give you guys uh, a brief overview of these four main ways. And then, of course, reiterate that originalism, original 
public understanding is really the way to read the document. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them uh, in the archive. I'll read through them a little bit later today or tomorrow. You can also email me, team at 10th Amendment Center .com. Don't forget that membership program, 10th Amendment Center .com slash members. Smash the like, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, all these types of stuff that I'm rambling on about. These will help us reach and teach more people about the Constitution and liberty and how to defend both when the government constantly refuses to do so, which it has been doing for at least my entire life. I'm sure everyone else's as well. If we're really honest about this. Again, I really appreciate you being here. I hope you had a great weekend. I hope your Monday's off to a good start. And I'll see you next time on the path to liberty.